hello, my name is Michael Carter Alt. I'm uh, the Immersive Technology Specialist here in the TMU uh, Libraries. So TMU is short for Toronto Metropolitan University. Uh, and for anyone who doesn't know, Toronto Metropolitan University is Ryerson University. And uh, with the name change, we are now Toronto Metropolitan University. And uh, Fangman. Hi, everyone. My name is Fangming Wang. I'm a, a librarian at the TMU Libraries. Uh, previously, I was the head of the Library Information Technology Services. That's why um, I was uh, I was uh, kind of helping the developing the uh, emergency view. And also, hopefully, today our presentation can give you some uh, uh, insight how uh, academic library can adopt uh, XR, te XR technology and help uh, enhance the teaching learning uh, research experience. Before we start our presentation today, uh, there there are a few technical terms I want to mention here. Uh, since we're gonna talk about those terms throughout our presentation, the first one, the VR. So VR is equivalent to virtual reality. So uh, for example, the Oculus Rift is a quite a well-known virtual reality headset. A second term is uh, AR. AR is equivalent to augmented reality. If you happen to play the Pokemon Go on your smartphone, that's a one good example of an AR app on your phone. Uh, the third term is uh, MR. Uh, MR is equivalent to mixed reality. So uh, Microsoft uh, HoloLens is one of the well-known mixed reality headset, uh, for example. Uh, the last term I want to mention is XR. XR is uh, equivalent to extended reality. Uh, XR actually is the umbrella of the term for AR, VR, and MR. My very first uh, experience with XR technology project was with a, uh, with a, actually a collaboration with an uh, architect prof at the TMU uh, more than 12 years ago. So we actually developed the architecture AR uh, app um, based on the uh, back days called a layer AI application. And uh, so this is probably explain uh, why uh, the academic library should consider embrace XR technology. Um, the main goal is to enhance teaching, learning, and research experience. So we have a review the uh, a very good report from ACRIL in 2021. Um, it's the environment scan report. Part of the um, report talk about XR implication and in, in the uh, academic setting. Um, so I, I really like the, the full recommendation from this report, particularly about XR technology. So the first recommendation is talking about the library should stay up to date on new development and in XR, VR, and AR technology, and the work and the collab with the campus partner to support useful uh, application implementation. So I, I totally agree with that um, recommendation based on my past few years experience, working with faculty and students is the key, they are the key for success. Second recommendation is about um, academic library should uh, uh, consider creating a collaborative space for accommodating and inco incorporating immersive technology in the library setting and to support a curriculum development. So we actually have a quite a few examples that we will um, explain in our uh, demos, uh, particularly with our immersive technology studio. Uh, third recommendation is about librarians should look to supplement instruction with the classroom practices and examples and that promotes immersive technology. And uh, at the same time, um, should the library should also provide development opportunity for faculty staff to do so. For that part, I think we um, have a, a couple of ex years experience for the library and the library staff uh, to get familiar with XR technology, but that's still a long way to go. Uh, the, the last recommendation is uh, from that report is about academic library should have a, a real opportunity to use XR technology to support their archive museums and their special collection initiatives. Uh, for that note, for that um, part, we actually did a collab with the Algonquin Museum in terms of the XR uh, technology pilot. So then the, the next question is, we always ask us is uh, where and how to start? So I can share a little bit of experience how we get, get here today. So um, at the TMU library, a very, probably back to go back to around 2015, when we opened the, our digital media experience lab, that's where we start looking to the XR, XR technology as uh, the digital media experience lab is a peer to peer learning based maker space. So we have a pilot, a few different uh, VR technology headset, particularly Ocul Oculus uh, Rift and uh, VR headset. So we observed a strong interest from students who want to try this kind of uh, new technology. In 2017, when we opened another new uh, technology-rich uh, interdisciplinary research hub, we called it uh, the Library Collaboratory. Uh, the, the main purpose is to support faculty and grad students in their research activities. And we also observed quite a strong interest 
and uh, for particularly from grad students uh, using XR technology for their MRP projects. For, in, in the last few years, we have gained a great um, understanding when we engage with our um, students and faculty. We also gain a lot of uh, hands-on experience through our collaboration with the uh, organizations such as the Agon Kong Museum and uh, all XR projects. At the same time, our library has also um, conducted an environment scan uh, for the, the strategic plan. Part of it is the uh, looking at uh, wh what's upcoming for the new technologies. So that really, that environment scan really made us seriously thinking about adopting XR technology into the library to support teaching, learning, and the research. Another very important uh, experience I want to share is that um, you have to have a, a really uh, good talent uh, in terms of supporting those kind of uh, immersive, uh, emerging initiatives. So we fortunately um, created a position called Immersive Technology Specialist, and uh, so which is uh, Michael, and uh, he joined us a, a couple of years ago. And uh, we also uh, recently, this year, we hired a, a part-time Immersive Technology Specialist who also has both digital media and architecture um, academic background. Looking back, um, I couldn't believe we did the, this, um, um, you know, even, you know, through the, the pandemic time. But um, now, now we're coming back to the campus, I'm more optimistic about our future in this emerging uh, initiative. Here, a couple of pictures I wanna, I wanna, sh I wanna show you. On, on, on the left side is, uh, um, my colleague Stephen Marston, who wear the uh, VR headset in the, our digital media experience lab. I believe that picture was taken in 2015. Um, the, on the right side, it's a picture taken probably um, in 2019, uh, which is actually Michael. Back in the day, he was uh, still a graduate student uh, working on his um, MRP project based on the XR technology. He's uh, actually he was actually doing a demo to our president. Um, so I think you can you can see we. We did a lot of uh, F, uh, work and uh, engage with our academic community that really helped us get to the uh, where we are today. So now I want to uh, I want to review what we have got so far in terms of extra technology and equipment and initiatives. So for TMU libraries, we actually quite have quite a lot of different kind of extra technology, and we have uh, um, quite a few uh, VR headsets like a. Uh, Meta Quest that student and the faculty can have access. We also even have a drone learning and research program that come with a, a LIDAR capture cameras. Uh, a lot of um, uh, faculty from geography and urban planning, they actually have uh, used uh, our service and the support uh, using drone and uh, LIDAR as a combination for the for their research project. And uh, we also have used the Microsoft uh, uh, Connect IR camera for motion detection related initiative. Uh, another really interesting technology we have is a, a holographic display. It's called a looking, looking glass. We actually apply that technology when we um, collaborate with the Alcoco Museum on the R&D project. And, uh, and also, uh, I think last year, we also got a, a tilt five mixed reality uh, system. And uh, we are still kind of, ex, um, kind of uh, trying to figure out how that mixed reality environment can be used for teaching, learning, and research. Last but not least, and uh, we, we set up this uh, immerse, immersion studio based on the Igloo Vision technology, uh, a, a, I would say two or three years ago. And uh, uh, since then it has been pretty popular within our faculty and students. Um, now I would like to explain a little bit about why we select the Igloo Vision technology uh, as, as a kind of core uh, technology facility for our immersion studio. Um, we have uh, actually, reviewed quite a few different um, options. And uh, we have also talked to several um, academic institutions, including Michigan State University. Um, and uh, we got a lot of good ins inspiration from those institutions. Many thanks to uh, all those institutions that provided feedback and uh, shared their experience with us. Um, it, it's, it's very easy to, uh, through our review, we realized it's actually very easy to make this kind of immersive space as for the uh, public relation purpose. However, we do find uh, PR is important, but the long term, what really matters is how this kind of technology environment can support, truly support teaching, learn, teaching learning and the, the research. Therefore, um, when we review the different options, the software compatibility, 
the, the um, flexibility of content creation and ease of use of the equipment are essential. So after you know, a really uh, solid review, we decided on the Igloo Vision as a uh, as our image studio kind of a technology solution. So now I would like Michael to discuss more about the technical feature of our immersion studio, and uh, give a and also give a few project demo. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, so now I would like to talk about some of the more technical uh, aspects of the immersion studio. So I provided a an actual graphic here on the right, and basically it shows kind of a top down view of what the immersion studio looks like. Um, it's essentially six meters in diameter, and uh, essentially it's a full three sixty projection cylinder. Uh, so it has five ceiling mounted projectors that stitch together essentially a full three sixty image. Um, it's got five point run surround sound speakers, so you can actually see that here on the graphic, uh, and including the subwoofer here in the back. Um, it provides essentially a better uh, accessibility for people with physical challenges. So um, if you think about VR headsets, sometimes you have to move your head around a lot uh, to see all the content around you. Otherwise you're just looking straight forward. Whereas in this space, you can maneuver yourself a little bit easier. You don't have to necessarily turn your head, but you can see also in the peripheral, your peripheral vision, you can see a little bit better VR content and 360 content. Um, essentially this also allows educators to explore new ways of presenting 360 content uh, and also to a larger number of students. So if you think traditionally speaking, when it comes to VR content, usually we have to pass one VR headset it around to different students one at a time. But in this context, you can actually bring a whole group of students in here up towards of, let's say, 12 people seated or 20 people sitting on the ground. And you can essentially present your content uh, much easier to a larger group of people. And then recently, I also equipped it with uh, VR controls, such as the HTC Vive base stations we see here. And then also for body tracking and motion tracking, there's a Microsoft Connect. Uh, and so what is the, really the need of a 360 environment? So there's a few main points here, but there's a whole list that could go on. But the main things are, well, one, it's a more attractive alternative to the traditional VR. So I have a, a picture of a VR headset here to show you that, um, like pretty much any VR headset, you have to physically strap it to your face. So um, if you think about COVID, for example, uh, even before COVID, some people might not have been comfortable with that. And now uh, post COVID, um, if they're not sanitized correctly, a lot of people are just not comfortable with wearing them on, on their face. And, and that is totally acceptable, right? So we have to think of different alternatives to presenting VR content and this is one of the ways to do it. Um, it provides a shared collaborative VR experience. So this is a little bit self-explanatory, but if you think about having a VR headset on, it's generally speaking very isolating and it's an individual experience where the immersion studio is a collaborative slash shared experience. Um, it also encourages cross-disciplinary collaboration. This is the mainly because we have the immersion studio here in the library and it allows us to collaborate with different programs across the university. And then the last thing, we've generally seen uh, increased demand for um, immersive spaces on campus. So I have already been getting a lot of emails since we've had this. Um, actually, at the beginning of the semester, um, we've been getting a lot of inquiries about capstone student projects using this for their immersive uh, final projects. So yeah, generally speaking, we there's been a need for uh, immersive spaces on campus, and we're really happy to have this now uh, in the library. Uh, and then this is an example of 360 documentary media from a digital media student. So I'm just going to kind of play just a few um, excerpts of this of this clip, just so you can get an understanding of what video looks like inside the immersion studio. It's been quite a time of stretching, taking and making a photo of a different message, and then it's all over. A time of coming to terms with not knowing. I'm just going to put it on pause there because one of the things that I want to highlight is this video uh, exists on YouTube but uh, the student uploaded it to YouTube so that it's easier for people to see online as a, you know, a more individual experience. But because it's on YouTube, she can actually send me the YouTube link and I can stream it directly into the Immersion Studio. So it allows me to play 360 videos straight from YouTube. And so you can kind of get an understanding of some of the, the shots that she's done here where she just has her 360 camera on a tripod. Right? And this is like you know her basically experience in Union Station, different shots of Toronto. And so the next uh, example I have here is uh, architectural simulation. So I've been working with uh, the architecture program a lot um, with creating a workflow that's easy for students to use, uh, undergraduate students particularly. Graduate students are you know, on a different level. They can uh, handle multiple programs a little bit easier, but undergraduate students, considering they're learning all these things for the first time, we're trying to create a very streamlined workflow for them to be familiar with their own 3D software and bring their 3D content into the Immersion Studio. So on the left-hand side is actually a full render of uh, architectural student project. So this was done by two undergrad architecture students, I believe in third year. Um, and it, it was a very successful um, workflow going from Revit to Twinmotion to Unreal. And then this is basically what the export looks like in Unreal uh, in the Immersion Studio. And then on the right side, I'm going to play this video, but it's essentially me inside the Immersion Studio using VR controls uh, with the HTC Vive base stations. So you can kind of get a sense of what it looks like from my perspective when I'm on the inside. And then I'm going to walk over to this chair, for example. And this is essentially what it looks like from a third person perspective. So I'm picking up that chair, which I can do so in the Immersion Studio as well. Um, 
And then again, I go to pick up this table and you can kind of see what it looks like from my first person perspective. And that's what it looks like from my third person, from the third person perspective. Okay. And then we're really uh, fortunate to have worked again with digital media students um, because they come from various disciplines or different backgrounds, some in uh, interior design, some in architecture, some in uh, digital storytelling. So these are two examples of actual student projects uh, using the Immersion Studio within different game engines. So the one on the left is a project um, within Unreal 5, and it was done by a master digital media student last year. So I'll play a little bit of it. It's a good example of essentially digital storytelling. And so I'm just going to kind of skip through this a bit. And then this volume a bit to explain that this is all running within a game engine. So this is all real-time rendering. This is all real-time animation. Um, and uh, it's it all runs very, very fluidly. And basically this entire project was a presentation on the Hindu god Ganesha. And uh, the student did a presentation basically where they were explaining um, the, the significance of Ganesha using the Unreal Engine and the Immersive, sorry, the Immersion Studio to show that. So the one on the right here is a group of students actually. So this is a group of students inside the Immersion Studio. You can kind of get a sense of just how many people can fit inside the Immersion Studio. But this is essentially a space simulation that was done by a group of students and uh, again, MDM. And so the, the final thing that I wanna show here is um, this is again running with, within the Unreal Engine, but this is essentially an indigenous VR simulation. Originally, this was only created for a VR experience, but we later were able to port it into the Immersion Studio as a more shared experience. And so just like the last, um, just like the last example, I'm able to use the actual controls to interact with objects such as pull up dialogue windows and maneuver around the, the actual environment in 360. Okay, so one of the things that I also want to talk about are faculty integration and metrics, because this is very important when we're introducing these technologies in uh, you know educational setting is we want to keep track of who exactly is using it, because uh, this is very important. So um, there's a few different specific programs that we've been able to get classes in for, which are digital media. So class sizes vary depending on the program. But for example, digital media, 30 students, class size for that, interior design, around 50 students, documentary media. This is graduate uh, level documentary media, uh, but those classes are usually around 30 students each. Architecture is a big program here on the campus, and we do we are working with a professor right now who usually has class, classes of up to 120 students. And then communication and culture, which is another big uh, program that is interested in using this space. Uh, generally speaking, that class size are capped around 90 students. So I should also mention that the interest in the Immersion Studio has these particular class sizes, but if students wanted to use this space for uh, their own projects, then usually the limit is around like 20 students per, per uh, section. So we have to kind of split them up in that sense into different sections, but uh, we are able to get interest from, again, particular programs that have these various uh, class sizes. So I'll let uh, Fengman conclude, and then we have one final slide after this. Thank you, Michael. Uh, so reflecting on the past two or three, two or three years of experience with the a wide range of uh, XR technology implemented in the, our library, and particularly the Immersion Studio. So I would say, like many uh, emerging initiatives in the academic libraries, uh, to have a good faculty uh, collaboration connection and a community engagement are the key. Uh, fortunately, we have a pretty good momentum now, in particular with the Immersion Studio space. As Michael mentioned, we have brought very, uh, quite a few different faculty student groups to the Immersion Studio such as the law, documentary media, English, aerospace engineering, new media, computer engineering, computer science. Um, and um, uh, actually next week, we are going to discuss with our business faculty regarding uh, using the Immersion Studio for a simulation pilot uh, project. I expect um, we will see more interesting um, and a diverse use case going forward. But again, as, I as we mentioned before, the key is really about uh, building a community. Uh, second, I will, um, important ref reflection I have is uh, talent, talent, talent. And uh, because immerse, Im uh, you know, emerging issues like uh, immersive technology or, or XR technology require specialized talents. It is critical for academic library to, to have the talent in order for the success of any em emerging initiatives. So we, I, personally, I learned a great deal about uh, from the from the emerging studio initiative. And without Michael and Eva, their effort, we probably won't get get there to have so many uh, kind of uh, exciting projects. Uh, the third reflection I have is uh, patience uh, for long-term success. Um, so the our, our final, goal, final goal is not necessarily about uh, implement a specific technology. Our final goal is about building a robust uh, uh, community. So technology can change very quickly, but your community will be with you for the long run. 
So for example, uh, um, if one day we no longer uh, use the existing um, you know, XR technology infrastructure or space because there's a better option, uh, I'm confident our, that our community will be interested and continue to work with us regardless of what the format of the XR technology we like to introduce to them. So, so here's kind of my reflection uh, uh, for the past two years of our, our project. So we would like to conclude there, and uh, we wanted to just um, provide our contact information uh, in case you're seeing this at some point and you want to contact us in the future about anything you can. We do have a QR code here for if you want to learn more about the Immersion Studio, you can scan that QR code, and then you can also, you know, the, the link is also provided. Also, the emails of all this, too. So if you wanted to contact Immersion Studio, uh, you can do that for inquiries. You can also contact myself directly or Feng Min. So, uh, yeah, thank you for listening. Thank you so much.